to a man like you, a man dedicated to spending his life in hallways. True. I'm going out for Sam. Mind a stall, will you? Give me one, too. What kind? Am I right? See? Yeah. You know, I think they enjoy being locked up for the night like this. In this crummy hotel? <laughs> At least they got rooms. I don't know why they didn't put us in the Waldorf. I don't think taxpayers would appreciate that. <laughs> I would. I'm one. What do you think of the vote? Six to six. It's silly, isn't it? A man like that ought to be... The judge told us not to talk about it. I'm sorry, sir. None of the jurors are allowed to make or receive telephone calls. I know, I know. I just wanted to hear the sound of another human voice before I go Betty by. Read me a story. I'm sorry. On general principles for keeping me here overnight, I'm tempted to change my vote to guilty. What do you think? I always save a roll from dinner if I eat out. Oh, sure, why not? In case I get hungry. If I'm hungry, I can't sleep. Mm, I know, I know. Happens to the best of us. Listen. How come a nice, quiet, pleasant woman like you is voting guilty? Because I think he ought to die for what he did. I do 20 every night before I go to bed. The last time I did 20 push-ups was 43, 44. And I said then, as I say now, <laughs> I prefer flab. Exercise is very important. Mm. It depends. Do you think it's important to that fellow on trial? No, I don't think so. I wish I wasn't here. I wish I didn't have this kind of responsibility. So why didn't you just tell him you don't believe in capital punishment? They'd have let you off. I do believe in it. So what's your problem? I don't see why I have to be in it. I don't like the feeling of having to vote on whether somebody lives or dies. Is that why you voted not guilty? I don't know. Maybe it is. How do I know? Oh, what do you know? When they sent us home for a night close, I forgot my toothbrush. I didn't forget my toothbrush, but I wish I'd grabbed a bottle of bourbon. Can I going to ask you something? What would your vote not guilty? I mean, it explains the nose on your face that, uh, here, that man killed. Look, there'll be no loose remarks about my nose. And I don't think he had the man killed. How could you not believe it? Well, I chose not to.
You know, I think half of those jurors are tickled to death with the idea of spending the night in the hotel. So is that all you're going to have? Nope. I've had my 900 calories for the day. You eat too much. Well, I feel like celebrating. Before the verdict, then? Absolutely. I know what you mean. I've never been so glad to be finished with a case in my whole career. I wouldn't exactly call this case a great pleasure, but I do hope we win it. The only thing is, it bothers me. And my reasons for hoping it. Don't let your reasons bother you. We're supposed to win. Well, it's just that sometimes I get the feeling of I'm working for my own ego instead of the client. Well, the result is the same. Is that good? Mm-hmm. You know, Frank Thorpe is an evil and violent man. And society would probably be better off if he was put away. If that jury frees him, I'll be proud of our work and sorry he's still walking around. You think he's guilty? I don't know and I don't care. We did our job. We protected his civil liberties and that's more important than anything. What do you call that? Oh, but it's a um, spaghetti, mezzo, pizzicato or something. Hmm. Try it. Hmm. It's good. I despise that man. So do I. So do I. Damage is well what, over. What, cream or lemon? Hold on a second. The Frank Thorpe jury, still out. The eight men and four women who are obligated to decide whether Thorpe lives or dies are quartered for the night at a hotel near the courthouse. They'll resume deliberation at 9 a.m. on the spectacular murder case. I'm sorry. Lemon. I wonder how they feel about it. Who? The jurors. How come they never say your name on television? What would they say about me? Assistant District Attorney Eugene Patterson prepared for bed. Supremely confident that the jury would hand down the verdict he fought so long and well to achieve. Guilty of murder in the first degree, he had some lemon with his tea. Hey, that rhyme. <laughs> well, they wouldn't have to say all that, but they could at least mention your name. Anyway, I think he's guilty. Why? Oh, I don't know. You wouldn't have prosecuted if he wasn't. Uh, be careful, that's hot. I mean, you prosecuted for murder in the first degree, and you tried very hard to win. And you probably will win, and he'll die. So you must believe he's guilty, and if you believe it, I believe it. Well, that's simple enough. You want some pound cake? No. I isn't it simple enough? I would love my job and my life if it were. Well, don't you? I don't know. I honest to God don't know. Well, it seems to me... What it seems to anybody isn't necessarily what it is. Well, what is it? Don't you want him to die? Sure, I want him to die. He deserves to die. I don't blame you. I wouldn't be sleeping either, if you know what I mean. Okay. You figure they could go out and they could argue a little bit and then make a decision. Well, they need overnight for, if you know what I mean. Right. You know, I mean, how thorough can you get? You can only go over the facts just so much. Boy, any schlump can be a juror. My old lady, she was a juror once. They'd be on trial when she was sitting there. She'd string up her own son. That happens to be me. Good. It's supposed to rain. Me, wise guy, I forgot my rubbers. <sighs> I'm such a wise guy. I got a perfectly good umbrella. I think I'd bring it with me, no. Wise guy. It's gonna come down. My mother, a genuine witch, she said so. All right. Look, if, if you don't want to pass the time with me, just say so, you know, I can take a hint if you know what I mean. What's your name? Stanley McGurk. Well, Stanley, here's the situation. If that jury finds me guilty, that judge is going to sentence me to death with mercy on my soul and all that. And then they're going to take me up to Ossining on the Hudson, a resort paradise. And they're going to charcoal broil me on their little grill, am I correct? But Stanley, if the jury votes me not guilty, then they'll give me back my hat, my coat, my wallet. I'll walk out of here a free man. You know what I'm going to do then, Stanley? I'm going to find myself a very tough, very large chap with a great big shiny gun. And you know what I'm going to do, Stanley? I'm going to give him a thousand dollars just to blow the back of your head off. If you don't want to talk, why don't you just say so, that's all. I mean, I can take a hint. Stanley. What do you want? Wise guy. Don't call your mother a witch. I hope you get off, Mr. Thorpe. So do I, Stanley. So do I. Look, 
What's the difference whether we're supposed to talk about it or not? It must make a difference, else they wouldn't say that. We're not supposed to talk about it unless we're all together talking. Look, you voted guilty just like me. Are you going to change your vote? I don't know. My guilty was tentative. Tentative? What does that mean? It means I'm not sure. Then why vote at all? Listen, I don't want to talk about it. What's the use of having rules unless you obey them? Oh, boy, oh, boy, you must spend your life standing on street corners just waiting for the light to turn red. I mean, before the trial started, you could just look at the man's face and see that he was guilty. All rise. Hear ye, hear ye. All those having business before trial term part 18 of the Supreme Court of the State of New York held in and for the County of New York, draw near, give your attendance, and ye shall be heard. Judge Lederman presiding. Be seated. Are you gentlemen ready? Ready, Your Honor. Ready, Your Honor. Proceed. Mr. Foreman, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. The purpose of an opening statement is simply to familiarize the jury with the facts of the case as they'll be presented by the people. Histrionics should play no part in it. Therefore, I expect that my performance will be dull. However, the facts in this case are so appalling that the manner of their presentation is unimportant. I promise you that you will stay awake. At approximately 2.30 on the morning of March 5th of this year, the body of Daniel M. Ferris was found in a vacant lot on East Houston Street. He had been shot through the forehead by a 45 caliber automatic pistol. The people will prove, ladies and gentlemen, that the murder of Daniel Ferris was contracted for by the defendant, Frank Thorpe, and was committed by one Herbert Jaffe, who received for his labors the sum of $1,000. The people will show that the motive of Frank Thorpe for this brutal murder by contract was one of financial gain, that he had a man slaughtered because he wanted to make money out of it. We will prove method, we will prove motive, we will prove opportunity, and we will prove premeditation. He was bored to death with the whole thing. If he was innocent, wouldn't he be indignant or something? He gave up before the trial began. Why did he do that? Because he's guilty. Nothing can make you change your mind about that. Of course, nothing. Even if it killed him? Especially if it killed him. He killed, didn't he? That's what we're not sure of. What time have you got? 11.15. Seems like four in the morning. Yeah. Wonder how Thorpe feels now. He's got a long night ahead of him. Well, I suppose that's my wine. That's only 10 or 15 calories. Well, I suppose if anybody can take it, he can. Oh, what a tough man. You know, the funny thing is, if we lose, I keep saying, well, if Thorpe loses, I think he's going to take it a lot better than you will. Probably. I must say, he astonished me the first minute we met. And uh, just because I'm Frank Thorpe, and just because Frank Thorpe has a trunk full of money in the cellar, I don't think you're going to get rich on this. You'll get a bill just like everyone else. For how much? $15,000 in advance. Win or lose? Of course. It's a lot of money. If you win, it's worth it. And if you lose, you won't have much need for the money anyway. You drive a pretty hard bargain. No bargain involved. That's my fee. <laughs> well, you know you've got me at a disadvantage. That's how I became a millionaire. Me too. Except I am, for real. That's very commendable. Now, suppose you answer some questions for me. By all means. Did you contract to have Daniel Ferris killed? No. Next question. Did you know Mr. Ferris? Sure I knew him. He was what you call a competitor of mine. In what business? We were fellow bricklayers. Come on, you read the newspapers, don't you? I'd like you to tell me. I contract for brickwork for construction jobs, so did he, Counselor, wearing me out with all this chatter. Do you know Herbert Jaffe? No, I don't. The district attorney says you paid Jaffe to kill Ferris. All you have to do is prove that I didn't. For $15,000, that shouldn't be too hard. Mr. Jaffe says you did. I didn't. What more can I tell you? If you don't know him, why would he name you? That's what I'm paying you all that lovely money to find out. You keep referring to money. If you have so much, why should it be that important to you? 
because I worked all my life like a horse to get it. Listen, Mr. Yale or Mr. Harler or whatever you are, I grew up at 48th Street and 11th Avenue. Even the beef in the stockyards had it better than me. I'm not crying, Mr. President. This is facts. I had a different lump on my head every day of my life until one day I found out that if I gave the lumps, I got less of them. So, I graduated. I became a hoodlum. After that, I became a crook. After that, I became a gangster. It's what you call stepping up in class. I stole. I broke things up. I beat people's heads in. I even killed. Now, that's privileged information, Mr. Preston, so you won't say anything about it. And I became very important and very rich. And then I went legitimate. I am now a respectable contractor. I have a home, a family, a butler, a Rolls Royce, all those nice little things. And the whole bloody exercise was all for money. It's a lot tougher than becoming a lawyer. But uh, I haven't the equipment to become a lawyer, so I had to do it my way. And I want to tell you something. I was right. Whatever I did, I don't worry about it. If I hadn't done it to them, they would have done it to me. Now I've got it all, and that's what I want. And you are going to see to it that I can continue to use it. I find it very difficult to be sympathetic to you, Mr. Thorpe. I want you to know that right now. I don't want you to be sympathetic. Just be brilliant. That's what you're getting paid for. I don't know why I didn't tell him right then I couldn't handle his case. Neither can I. Why didn't you? Who knows? Once in a while, I like to test my self-control. Anyway, it's over. What did you say this was called? That's a meatballs mezzo pizzicato or something. So well, what about your diet? I gave that up. You just started it this morning. You said it was a celebration. You know, the willpower for flounder. If there was a flounder on the plate, I'd eat it, too. I eat it in two parts. It takes longer, so it fills me up more. Why don't you carry a refrigerator around with you? <laughs> you know, that's very funny. <laughs> I wonder how he feels. Why should you care? The whole thing's too gruesome even to talk about. It is? Then how come you talked about it more than anyone else in that jury room? I don't remember that I did. Oh, come on. You relished that whole scene in the empty lot with the corpse lying in the garbage and all that. I did? Tell the court and the jury in your own words what, if anything, you saw that was unusual as you were making your rounds on the morning of March 5th of this year. Yes, sir. At approximately 2.15 a.m., I was passing the empty lot on East Houston and Mulberry. I saw an object lying near the south edge of the lot, and I went over to look at it. It was the body of a man, later identified as Daniel Ferris. He had been shot through the head. He was dead. Did you make a search of the lot for the bullet that killed Daniel Ferris? Yes, sir. The bullet had entered the forehead and emerged from the back of the head, taking half of the skull with it. Uh, we can dispense with that kind of detail. Yes, sir. I found the bullet a few feet from the body. It was a 45 caliber soft-nosed bullet which had been cut twice across the nose to enable it to spread on contact. It was the type commonly called a dum-dum bullet. I show you this object. Can you identify it? Yes, sir. That's the bullet I found. I watched you while that thing was being described. You couldn't have been happier. Happier? If you want to know how I felt, I felt disgusted. With certain people, that's the same thing. Very nice. Very nice. Why do you have to get so personal all of a sudden? Who asked you in the first place? I don't think that they proved that Thorpe was guilty. The back of the man's head was shot off. What's that got to do with it? Nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing. I don't think Thorpe hired that man to do the killing for him. He's not the type. Then why would the man say he did? Look, you're wasting your breath. No one's going to change my mind. He's guilty. When I was a kid, they told me never to turn down the corner of a page to mark my place. I just did it, and I'm glad. I may turn down every corner in that book. What's wrong, dear? What's bothering you? Frank Thorpe. It isn't as if you didn't have plenty of cases to keep you awake. But tell me, 
What's so special about that one? I guess the man. I don't know. I'm not really involved anymore. It's up to those 12 intelligent and unbiased jurors. He lives or dies according to their whim. Do you think whim is the right word? Oh, and according to their conviction. The point is, unless he's the greatest actor of all time, he couldn't care less. They don't worry him. Why should you care now whether he's worried or not? Do you want him to be worried? In the privacy of our bedroom, I'll admit it. Yes, I want him to be worried. All the forces of society, spearheaded by your fearless husband, are lined up against him. And I'd feel a lot more potent if he'd just cringe a little. It's not very attractive, is it? No. I know. I shouldn't let him affect me this way. But ever since I met him, he has. I'm just an ordinary guy. He's unique. Maybe that's what bothers me. Let me say it before you say it. You're a district attorney. You want to ask me a few questions. I don't have to answer them. But if I do, anything I say will be used against me. Well, friend, I'm going to answer any questions you have to ask. So go right ahead and indulge yourself. That's very kind of you, Mr. Thorpe. I've always been known as a kind man. Ten years ago, I won the Kindest Man Award at the annual Bricklayer's Ball. Ask your questions. Did you contract to have Daniel Ferris murdered? No, sir. Did you know a man by the name of Herbert Jaffe? No, sir. Did you give Herbert Jaffe $1,000 to kill Daniel Ferris? No, sir. Did you know Daniel Ferris? Yes, sir. How did you know him? He was in the same business I'm in, sir, bricklaying. He owned a firm which competed with yours? Yes, sir. And didn't he also grow up in the same neighborhood in which you lived? Yes, sir. And weren't you once partners? Yes, sir. And didn't you sell out to him? Yes, and go sir. go into business for himself? Yes, in sir. In competition with you? Yes, sir. And wasn't his competition hurting your business? Yes, sir. And when he died, didn't your business improve immeasurably? Yes, sir. And didn't you have him killed to achieve this purpose? No, sir. Now I have one question for you. Aren't you one of the most stupid men who ever lived? Hello, Frank. Not one of the most stupid, the most stupid. All right. Mr. Jaffe, who is this man? Frank Thorpe. What can you tell me about him? He'll pay me $1,000 to kill Daniel Ferris. Cash? That's right. Did he hand it to you personally? He did. Is there anything you want to say about that? You're creating a problem for me. Now, if you know anything about me at all, you know that's a ridiculous thing to do. You're going to wind up being hurt. Are you threatening me? You got any reason why I shouldn't? Any time a man is that sure of himself, no matter what he's done, I worry. I hope I've got him nailed, but I don't know. I keep getting the feeling that somehow he knows more about it than I do. All right, honey. Go to sleep. He broods best who broods alone. All right. Let me try to convince you again. What for? Why don't we just talk politics? Because in politics, there is no reasonable doubt. Don't you know that the man who's genial on the surface and cynical underneath always wins? That's ridiculous. Well, be that as it may, there is a reasonable doubt that this Frank Thorpe is guilty. And if you don't see it, then you're a little soft in the head. I'll ignore that. Look, I'll prove it to you. Now, you sat there and saw just what I saw. Now, all you have to do is realize it. I mean, just take the opening statement of the defense attorney. Just that alone ought to convince you that you are sitting in judgment on a crime that has no relationship to the defendant. And we will show that the district attorney has no proof that Frank Thorpe was connected with the crime with which he is charged. We will show that the entire case against Thorpe is based upon the false testimony of a convicted extortionist, embezzler, forger, and petty thief. A man whose entire adult life has been spent in crime. We will prove that Herbert Chaffee has sought and obtained special treatment from the district attorney's office in return for his statement implicating Frank Thorpe in the crime for which Thorpe is being tried. And we will show that that man, Herbert Chaffee, the man who committed the killing, 
and who now attempts to excuse his crime of murder by claiming merely to be a hired hand, is in reality the man who conceived and committed the crime. And when that man, Herbert Chaffee, testifies, I ask you to keep one question in your minds. Why is he testifying? Remember, ladies and gentlemen, the burden of proof is always on the prosecution. The defense doesn't have to prove anything. We expect that you will find reasonable doubt and declare Frank Thorpe not guilty. You looked as if you had your mind made up before you even heard the testimony. All right, maybe I did. Let me ask you, that man on trial claimed that he did not even know the hired killer. Now, how did the hired killer pick him out of eight million people as the man who did the hiring? Answer me that. So I'll say, okay, there's reasonable doubt. Right? I will. Thorpe lied when he said he didn't know the man. That's simple. He told a small lie to protect himself. What's the difference? They still haven't proved that Thorpe hired the man to commit the murder. That's his story, not Thorpe's. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Well, I don't know why not. It's happened to us before. I'll tell you why not. If it is a hung jury, There'll be a new trial, and I can't bear the thought of defending Frank Thorpe again. That's why not. Okay. Just a suggestion. It's a rotten suggestion. Well, you know, they had over eight hours to talk before they ever got to the hotel. And you know what happens to certain jurors who voted guilty when other jurors try to change their minds. It's embarrassing to admit you're wrong in front of 11 other people. I think it makes them twice as stubborn. Stop, or I'll spend the night in my own house. Okay. The discussion's tabled. I wonder where Mrs. Thorpe is tonight. Probably home. Yeah. It must be rough on her, you know, waiting. I kind of like her. She's an unusual woman. Well, she'd have to be to be happily married to Frank Thorpe. Funny thing is, I think they are happily married. <laughs> she loves him. What's so unique about that? Lots of good women love dreadful men. That's not what I meant. I was thinking about her attitude towards him. That's Frank's decision, not mine. He's the one who wanted me to ask you. Is that right, Frank? Yes. Well, why? Why ask me? Who else have I got to ask? Why ask at all? I don't understand. Well, you think about it. Uh, what they're trying to do in there is to kill me. We understand that. Now, uh, since they're trying, I got to figure they at least have a chance. Otherwise, they wouldn't have started up, correct? Now, my lawyer, who is so high priced, he insists upon being called an attorney, announces to me as follows. Maybe, he says, uh, maybe he can convince the district attorney fellow to make a deal with me. I plead guilty to a less serious charge, like second degree murder or manslaughter or jaywalking or something. And I go to jail for X years. And that's a decision I can't make for myself. Why? Because I'm not alone. Because I have you. Because it so happens I love you. So I, uh, I told my lawyer, uh, my attorney, to ask you. And you want me to decide? Yes. I don't suppose you would have brought this up if you didn't have a chance to convince the district attorney. No. There's a small chance. And you want me to decide, Frank? Yes. Yes, I really do. You don't usually leave things like this up to me. We don't usually have this kind of thing to think about. I love you very much. I don't suppose I have to tell you that, but I want to. <sighs> oh, about that, but sentimentality right in the middle of a murder trial. Frank, this is what I think. Either you committed this thing, or you didn't. If you didn't, you mustn't plead guilty to anything. What for? Why should you? If you did what they say, and I don't even want to listen to that because I wouldn't want to be tempted to believe it. I don't see why you should agree to a lie, and I don't see why they should. You're entitled to a fair trial, and I suppose you're getting one. And that's good enough, isn't it? Mrs. Thorpe, sometimes expediency is a necessary thing. Right now, it could mean the difference between your husband living or dying. But will it be? I don't know. And if he lives because of your expediency, where and how will he live? In prison. You don't offer much, do you? I suppose not to you. And to him? I can't answer that. Living means different things to different people. The judge is coming back in. Thank you. 
Mrs. Thorpe. The time is now. I say no deal. Give the little lady a great big hand. You better be a big genius in there, Mr. Attorney. Otherwise, I may have to belt her around the block someday for that. You asked me. I love you. Anyway, for his money, let him sweat. I wonder whether he did it. Remember what it says on page 57. I know. It's not supposed to matter to us. We're not judges or jurors. We're advocates, et cetera, et cetera. But aren't you curious? You bet I'm curious. Oh, boy, that's beautiful. You sound like Johann Sebastian Shostakovich. Why couldn't they put me in with one of the women? Why do they have to be so rigid about these things? The entire hotel is on fire. How can you sleep? Is it because you're old or because you did your duty and voted not guilty with me? Suppose tomorrow morning we go back down there and some of these idiots convince us and a couple of others to change our votes. It could happen, you know. We're only human. And then what happens? This fellow dies. Impossible. I mean, it's pretty obvious he didn't do it. Or is it? Who knows? Who really knows? For how long have you known the defense? Frank Thorpe? For about a year and a half. I worked for him. Now, Mr. Jaffe, did you have a conversation with Frank Thorpe about a week before Mr. Ferris was found dead? I did. Can you tell us where and when it happened and what was said by each of you? Uh, right. Well, uh, I was working on a scaffold at this building on 2nd Avenue and 80th Street. We're up about 12 stories there. It's a Friday. Around 3 o'clock, very windy. So, uh, Mr. Thorpe gets on a scaffold with me and uh, sends my partner away. He says he wants to talk to me. Well, okay, he's the boss, so I got to listen. And he comes right to the point. Uh, he offers me $1,000 cash, 500 then and 500 after, if I'll kill this man, Daniel Ferris, for him. So I, uh, I told him I'd uh, think about it. He said, uh, let him know Monday. He had a gun for me, and he'll finger this Ferris for me. Hey, get Finger him, point him out. So I told him I'd let him know. And did you let him know? Yeah. yeah. He was there Monday early, and I told him I'd do it. What happened then? Give me the $500 and a gun. I uh, show you this 45 caliber automatic pistol. People's Exhibit A in evidence. Can you identify it? Yeah. That's the gun. And what, if anything, did you do with this gun? On the following Saturday night, I shot uh, Daniel Ferris through the front of the head with it and dumped his body out of my car in a vacant lot on East Houston Street. And what happened after that? Monday morning, Mr. Thorpe gave me the other $500. He, uh, he said I did a good job, and he appreciated it. Did uh, Mr. Thorpe say anything to you in connection with this gun? Yeah, he told me to get rid of it. And did you? No, I kept it. Did you have a reason for doing that, Mr. Chaffee? Yeah. Stupidity. Stupidity, I'll say. Old man, you and I have to stand firm tomorrow morning. Right now, I think that man Jaffe's a liar. I may convince myself that I'm wrong, but I wouldn't want anybody else to do it. It's the way I am, stubborn, or possibly stupid. Who knows? Fasten your seatbelts, everybody. What's the matter? I'm oh, sorry, I woke you. I guess I had a nightmare. Write it down. I don't have one of those doctors. I don't even remember it anyway. Oh, I'll never get to sleep now. I'm sorry. Why don't you put the light out? I'm wide awake. It doesn't matter. 
Maybe you had that nightmare because you voted guilty. It's ridiculous. I know. I just thought it would give us something to talk about. It's kind of funny spending the night with a complete stranger. They ought to give you sleeping pills when you have to do this. Listen, I'm really sorry about waking you. It's all right, honestly. Tell me something. Why did you really vote guilty? I'm curious. I think he is. On account of that one witness, Jaffe? More or less. What do you mean, more or less? How do I know? I think he's guilty. What am I supposed to do? Suppose you're wrong. Well, how is anybody going to know that? You don't find out the truth afterwards. You do what you think is right, and that's the end of it. Suppose I say not guilty, and I'm wrong. Look. That Jaffe just didn't seem to be the kind of a man who'd make up a story like that. I don't think he's smart enough or bad enough. You know, you have to be pretty brassy to get up on the stand and carry off something like that if it's a lie. But I don't think he really carried it off at all. I think that defense lawyer proved that Mr. Jaffe was a liar. And isn't it a fact that you fabricated the entire story and that none of it actually happened? Isn't that true, Mr. Jaffe? Oh, all right then, let's go into it. You say you were hired as a bricklayer by Mr. Thorpe. Yeah. Where had you worked previous to that job? Nowhere. Would you explain that? I was in prison. For how long? <clears throat> Three and a half years. Could you tell the court and jury the nature of the crime for which you were convicted? Extortion. Extortion? And had you ever been in prison before that? Yeah. For forgery? <clears throat> yeah. Isn't it true that you had had three previous convictions? One for bookmaking, one for petty larceny, and one for simple assault? Yeah. Now tell me, Mr. Jaffe, did you discuss the case with the district attorney before he called you to testify? Yeah. And you confessed to first-degree murder, didn't you? Yeah. You expect to be tried for first-degree murder? Mr. Jaffe, isn't it true that you were offered a deal by the district attorney if you agreed to testify in this trial? Objection! Isn't that why you confessed? I object, Your Honor. Overruled. I'll allow this line of questioning on the issue of credibility. Didn't you confess to this murder, Mr. Jaffe? Because the district attorney agreed to allow you to plead guilty to a lesser charge than first-degree murder. No. <clears throat> Didn't you agree to testify against the defendant in order to save your own life? No. All right. How much money did Daniel Ferris have in his pocket when you murdered him? I don't know. Well, didn't you look? No. Weren't you alone with him in your car? Yeah. Well, how could you pass up a golden opportunity like that? I don't know. Oh, incidentally, how did you get him into your car? I hit him on the head, dragged him in. Then you drove him to East Houston Street, shot him, and dumped him into the street, isn't that it? Yeah. You heard the testimony of the police officer who discovered the body, didn't you? Yeah. You heard him say that Daniel Ferris had no money. As a matter of fact, had no wallet on his person, didn't you? Yeah. Didn't you steal his wallet? No. Isn't that why you killed him? No. Wasn't it a plain, ordinary mugging? No. And didn't Mr. Ferris resist? I said no. All right, no. All right, Mr. Jaffe. Did you know of your own knowledge that Frank Thorpe and Daniel Ferris, the man you murdered, were competitors in business? Well, yeah, Frank Thorpe told me that. And didn't it occur to you, when the district attorney was questioning you, that you could save your own life by accusing Frank Thorpe of masterminding this killing? No. It's the truth. Who suggested the idea that you turn people's evidence? You are the district attorney. Well, he did. After you concocted the story about Frank Thorpe? I didn't concoct it. But the district attorney did suggest that you confess and testify, didn't he? Didn't he? Yeah. And didn't he offer you a deal? Didn't he say he'd try to go easy on you if you'd help him? If he didn't, could you tell me why you're helping him? He did offer you a deal, Mr. Jaffe, didn't he? Yeah. I don't think the jury heard that. Yeah. No further questions. That man is a liar. I don't see how you can think of anything else. He committed a mugging, he got caught, and he made up that story about Thorpe to save his own life. He even lied on the stand. You don't think it was a coincidence that the man he mugged was Frank Thorpe's biggest competitor? Sure, it was a coincidence, but coincidences happen. I don't see how you can take his word for anything. I don't see how I can either. <sighs> But I think I do. I eat health foods. A lot of people say I'm crazy. But if you got to look at the statistics, you'd know what I mean. 
I bet you eat wheat germ three times a day. <laughs> Do you realize when you die, an entire wheat field will sprout out of your coffin? You can joke about it all you want. We're used to that. I haven't had a cold in eight years. I expect one tomorrow. Yeah, but I get a feeling that adversity broadens me. Listen, I know we're not supposed to talk about this, but you could help me out here. I still don't know why you voted guilty. Why do you have to know that? It's part of the deal. We're supposed to use reason and logic to defend the position we took. Let's hear your logic. All right. Why didn't Frank Thorpe take the stand and say he was innocent? He's not required to testify against himself. Well, that's in the Constitution. You heard of it? Sure, I've heard of it. So what does that mean? If a man is innocent, he should want to get up in court and say so, wouldn't you? Uh, depends. His lawyer thought it would be better for him if he didn't. How do you know? I don't know. I'm just guessing. I'm putting you on the stand this afternoon because I want to ask you just one question. Which is what? Did you contract to have Daniel Ferris murdered, to which you will answer no? Why do you need that? Anybody in his right mind knows I'm going to answer no if you ask that. What good does it do me? The jury wants to hear you say it. All right, I say it. Then the DA gets up and makes hash out of me. Can he? What do you mean? Oh, come on. We're not going to start that again, are we? No, I didn't do it. It's going to help a lot if you get up on the stand and say just that. We haven't got much time, Mr. Thorpe. I'm not going on the stand. I think it's important that you do. And I said I can't. I don't care what you think. Could you tell me why? Supposing I told you that it was because I was afraid. Anybody's going to be nervous about getting on the stand. I mean afraid. I mean like I won't be able to breathe. I mean like I won't know who I am, what I'm doing, or what I'm saying. Do you understand me? We're talking about your life, Mr. Thorpe. I'm not going to get up on that stand in front of all those people and talk. Because I can't. Look at my hand. Now, I can't do it. I'll look guilty. They'll think I'm guilty. You leave me alone. You've got this case one without me. No, I haven't. I need you. And I said I can't. Now, get out of here. Get out of here. He was standing on his constitutional rights not to testify. If he was innocent, he should have said so. There's nothing hard about that. I like a person who comes right out and says what he thinks. That man isn't honest. He isn't down to earth. Down to earth? He's half underneath the earth. The vote is six to six. He's half free also, isn't he? Let's go to bed. I gotta have my eight hours and my entire chemistry goes out of kilter. I get an imbalance of acids. Oh, we couldn't have that, could we? No, not right here in front of everybody. God forbid. You okay? I bet you dime you get off. You're faded. Another two hours this morning. We'll be going out to lunch soon. What do you think? Who knows? Maybe a hung jury. Larry, hate to see this guy get off. He's guilty. I don't think so. He's capable of it, but I don't think he did it. Hello, Mrs. Thorpe. I hope everything will be all right. Thank you. It's a 50-50 chance. I know. It practically always is. We never really know. Oh, yeah. Okay. The jury's coming back. Good luck. I don't know. They're always the same. 
absolutely impassive. I've heard so many times about juries. If they look at the defendant, he's acquitted. If they don't, he's convicted. Doesn't mean a thing. He's looking at you, she isn't. There are no rules. All rise. What's that for? Probably nothing, just routine. Mr. Foreman, have you reached a verdict? We have. I think there's something I'd like to tell you. Will the foreman rise and face... Whatever happens now happens. Nothing's going to change. I can't say I'm crazy about you, but you did a good job. Will the defendant rise and face the jury? Mr. Foreman, what is your verdict? I think you ought to know, Counselor, I'm guilty. I had him killed. Not guilty. You find the defendant not guilty of the charge. So say you all. The defendant is released from custody forthwith. Jury is dismissed with thanks of the court. Jurors will report to the central jury room. Court is adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Preston. Thank you very much. Counselor, I told you, you didn't need me on that stand. You were right. Thanks, Counselor. Oh, uh, uh, by the way, I'd appreciate it if you'd send a receipt to my office for the check my secretary mailed you. I like to clean these things up. Otherwise, they stick in my mind and become annoying. Know what I mean? Congratulations. Thanks. And I couldn't sleep last night. You know why? I was afraid he'd get away with it. I'll bet you any amount you name, he told you he's guilty. Didn't he, Larry? Conversations with my clients are privileged. Oh, sure. Well, I never doubted it for one second. He's guilty for sure. Do you want me to pin the tag on you now? What tag? The one that says I am brilliant. Or maybe you prefer the one that says kick me hard. Gene, you know better than that. It was their decision, not yours or mine. Since when do they know what they're doing? You know how the system works as well as I do. Once in a great while, a guilty man goes free. We can afford that a lot better than we can afford to have an innocent man convicted. Better men than you and I have worked the system out, and it works, and you know it. So what are you complaining about? I happen to be a soloist, all right? All right. 